Shalom and welcome to the Vibe of the Tribe podcast from JewishBoston.com. I'm Miriam Anzavan and I'm here with my co-hosts Dan Seligson and Ashley Jacobs for our annual spooky season Halloween episode. Hello, Dan and Ashley. Hello, Miriam. Miriam. And Ashley. And Dan. Our guest today is four-time returning champion friend of the podcast author, a cult expert, and a man we would want to have by our side during a seance, Peter Biebergall. Hey, Peter. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here again. So has it been four Halloweens? Is that basically what we've been up, up to? This is our fourth Halloween episode with you, amazingly. Yes. And I have to say, Peter, each year that you're on the podcast, we cover something that we think is suitably or seasonably scary. We have talked about monsters and demons, the undead, and the occult in Jewish folklore and mythology. But we know, Peter, that your expertise extends into realms far beyond that. This year, we've decided to shake it up a bit and leave our usual haunted graveyards and golem attics and go where no Halloween episode of this podcast has gone before, science fiction. And as we know, science fiction can be just as unnerving, just as scary, and just as Jewish as the occult topics we've covered so far with you. So let's make our Vulcan salute, a.k.a. the gesture of the Kohen Gadol, and set forth on this adventure with you. So, Peter, I'm going to kick it off and ask, um, how have you been, first of all, and what scary things have you been working on, reading, or watching since we had you in last year's Halloween episode? So, most recently, I do have a, a new book out. It's an edited volume of short stories called Appendix N, The Eldritch Roots of Dungeons and & Dragons. And just briefly, it's in the very first edition of the Dungeon Master's Guide, penned by Gary Gygax. He included an Appendix N, in which he lists the stories and authors and books that he said had the biggest influence on him when he was working on the game and as he was growing up. And so this volume is essentially an attempt to collect what I saw as the most interesting of the stories and authors from that list. Um, and that's available at all your local bookshops and and online retailers. And that was published by a wonderful British um, outfit called Strange Attractor Press, um, which is also distributed through MIT Press. So you can actually do it directly through them as well. So that's what I've been working on. And that that is definitely what's interesting about that list, too, is that it does include sort of what we now call sort of science fantasy. So you have, um, or what were often called um, uh, sword and planet stories, where you had sort of fantasy elements, but they would take place on other planets. So John Carter, Warlord of Mars, is sort of one of these kind of stories. that. Um, so it's a very interesting to think about the intersection also of science fiction and fantasy, which is, I think, something we'll have to touch on when we get deeper into this conversation. Um, I've been watching a lot of the sort of early um, monster movies from the 30s, the Universal Studio horror movies. I just, my wife and I just recently watched Bride of Frankenstein, which is also a great science fiction horror story, which some could argue the legend itself is somewhat modeled on the story of the golem. Um, so there's a little bit of that um, in there. And believe it or not, though, my main source of joy lately has been the least science fiction horror monster thing that you could possibly imagine, with a hint, though, of Jewishness, uh, Downton Abbey. Whoa, whoa. What? Oh, interesting. Well, that's some more. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. See that coming. I was going to say the Red yeah, Sox, but no, Downton, Downton Abbey. Abbey. So. Lot twist. But there is, you know, the, I don't know if you watch it, but one of the main characters, Cora, her father is Jewish, and there's a whole Jewish subplot later um, where one of the people marries into a Jewish family. Anyways, no aliens, though. No, nothing. We're not. There's no moment where any ghosts have been haunting the manor or anything, so... Um, we're not prepared with any doubt yeah, no, 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 no. so yeah, we're yeah. probably going to have to move on I think. <laughs> so confession I am the least learned in science fiction out of the four of us so I'd love to just take a step 
back before we dive into our conversation. What is science fiction and how does it intersect with the supernatural and occult? Well, one thing that we have to really start out with is really defining what we want that term to mean. This genre is so broad to include science fiction, fantasy, um, you know, urban fantasy, so new wave science fiction, hard science fiction, that there's a broader term that people like to use, which is just speculative fiction. But if we want to talk about science fiction per se, then I think we should limit it to those authors, stories, narratives that have something to say about our relationship to um, to science, to technology, to visions of the future, say, as opposed to visions of the past or visions of the past that um, are alternative, right? So that's uh, alternative history sort of tend to fall more into the science fiction side of the genre. The problem in talking about the sort of Jewish relationship to science fiction is that Jewish fiction, when tending toward the speculative, tends to bend towards the myths and folklore of you know, of the culture and of that come out of the Bible, that come out of Eastern Europe, that come out of different places. And so we have people like, you know, Singer, who isn't dealing with science fiction themes at all, but is dealing more with with science, with fantasy or um, supernatural things that arise out of those sort of, you know, uh, tales. We really have to cleave off those parts that are related to, say, um, the supernatural or the occult or folklore, because that's really, you know, and we've discussed all this in, in past episodes, that's really a tradition of Jewish fiction uh, that I think is its own thing. And it's, but it's going to be difficult to parse, I think, in some ways, because Jewish science fiction might even be m less about Jewish themes, but rather Jewish hopes and fears than, say, in something that's more traditionally, um, you know, a Jewish story based on a tale of a Dybbuk, right, or or of a golem or of spirits or of talking to um, the dead. Yeah, exactly. So how does science fiction feed into fear? And what's the scariest science fiction you've encountered and why? Generally speaking, yeah. So, I mean, I think science fiction, what's also interesting is science fiction that tends to deal with the cosmos writ large as an unknowable, uh, fearsome, ineffable thing, which in some ways has a little Kabbalistic tinge to it, right? When we think about Ein Sof, when we think about the idea that the ultimate universe, the ultimate source of all things, is one that should ultimately fill us with terror. So I'm thinking about, um, you know, you could even argue that some of H.P. Lovecraft wasn't the best friend to the Jews, but, um, you know, his, <laughs> his horror tends towards this sort of cosmic, um, anti-rational idea, although he himself was a strict rationalist and probably an atheist, right? So, uh, but it is about this sort of incomprehensible universe that to even glimpse it would lead to madness, which to me speaks to the, to the great dictum, no one shall look upon me and live, right? Which is what one could argue the Godhead <laughs> ultimately is the message to to the Jewish people, right? And to maybe all of us. Um, but then there's some of the great uh, films like Event Horizon, um, Alien. I think the film Sunshine, which is not always, uh, I think Danny Boyle is the director, is not always well-received. I think it's a great cosmic horror science fiction film. 
that sort of deals with, you, you know, trying to get too close to sort of the ultimate source of things and being destroyed by it. I'm very interested in science fiction that does that. I even think that Star Trek, um, the Borg, is a representation of that because it's it, it's not – we're going to really get into Let's the it, deep weeds here. But for those that are familiar with The Next Generation, and there they encounter this civilization called the Borg, who now becoming aware of humanity and Starfleet finds their way back to our sector of the galaxy um, and begins to wage war, um, which extends over through, you know, the rest of really the mythology of, of Star Trek. No, but that's great because I've always thought of the Borg as, I'm sure everybody does, essentially about assimilation, very literally. Right, exactly. Exactly. And I think that that's part of what we're what we see with sort of, you know, let's step back, though, a little bit. Um, the, the word science fiction itself was coined by a Jew. Um, and I want to make sure I get his his name correct. I want to say it uh, correctly which is uh, Hugo Gernsback, who was, a, who was from Luxembourg. And he essentially developed the whole genre via a magazine called Amazing Stories starting in 1926. And I highly recommend actually an article um, called Jews in Space by Lavi uh, Tidhar, which I had – so I had not known that fact until um, I read that uh, recently. And so, you know, we're already starting. And so the question is, what is it? And I think it's your question that is attractive to Jewish writers and creators about sort of science fiction. So I have always found certain things about sci-fi uh, very Jewish. For example, the concept of a generation ship, which is uh, leaving planet Earth, going on a ship and traveling however many light years to a promised land, quote unquote, um, of a habitable planet or something like that. Right, exactly. Passengers. <laughs> right, right. Oh, God, passengers. The Genesis asteroid, right. the Genesis but, uh, project. That definitely reminds me of, obviously, the story of Moses and the Israelites. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, but it it wasn't the, the Israelites who left Egypt who actually entered the promised land. It was their children. So I always think about that when I hear about a generation ship. Um, it was their descendants. So what do you find specifically very Jewish about sci-fi and what ideas, and you began to touch upon this earlier, can be traced back to Jewish authors or the Jewish experience? Before we go there, I want to say something which I think is really important when talking about Jewish creators in science fiction. And that is this, that Flannery O'Connor, not Jewish, Catholic, struggled with this idea of what it meant to be a Catholic writer. Okay? Her Catholicism was an essential part of who she was. But she wrote at length on the idea that even though she is a Catholic writer, her writing is not Catholic, but it contains all the things that she as a Catholic cares about or finds important or essential or of meaning. So when we think about Jewish writers in science fiction, which is why I wanted to really make that distinction, too, between Jewish writers working in the supernatural realms, Jewish science fiction writers and creators don't tend to populate their stories with Jewish things, but the stories themselves contain those things that are important to the Jewish experience, right? So – a lot of it is, and I think it's a it's a question that that we're we're going to come up against a lot is that it's coded. It's not dibics. It's not things that are blatantly Jewish or that even characters themselves are Jewish, right? It's these ideas that you're pointing to: generationships, um, diasporas, 
right? Feeling like a stranger in a strange land. Like those are the things that, that we need to, I think, be thinking about looking for rather than, again, you know, things that are more explicitly Jewish that we might find in Jewish tales or Jewish writers who deal with with fantasy, horror, and supernatural themes. So that kind of brings me to the the idea of why sci-fi speaks to Jews in the way that it does. I so many people I know who are Jewish love 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 sci-fi. And and I kind of have two theories. I don't know if they're particularly original, but that I wanted to uh run by you and and get your thoughts on it. One is the idea that um, in the early 20th century, Jews did not have a lot of opportunities uh, compared with other people in American society. So they tended toward edgier things. They some, you know, one of the reasons why Jews uh, were some of the early pioneers in Hollywood is because they were like, hell, this is something we can do. So they they took that opportunity. There weren't a lot of other options. Sci-fi or or edgy stuff was one of the avenues that was open to them. The other one I was thinking about is this idea of inherited or transgenerational trauma, Jews wanting to be somewhere else, have a secret identity, uh, be transported to another place that is better than the hellhole that they find themselves in in certain times in their history. I just wanted to, you know, your yeah. take on that would be fascinating to hear. No, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not sure I 100% agree with... Um, the idea of Jews in in Hollywood and things working specifically on things that weren't mainstream. I mean, I think the truth of the matter is the most mainstream Hollywood things are were and are often created by Jews. There's nothing more Jewish than White Christmas, That's- right? So I think we it's do important, love a white you know, Christmas, don't we? <laughs> you know, but so really in terms of thinking about, you know, that, that what had to happen though, was that they could not write things explicitly Jewish. Right. So, so yes, when there were opportunities though, to do exactly what you're saying, to be coded in that way, then you start to see things happening within those genres. But I don't think the genres are what brought yeah. Jews necessarily to the Hollywood or to those creative things. I think they were there and assimilated, but found other opportunities to do the things that they were really concerned with, like, say, something like the creation of Superman, right? Um, and, and really a great science fiction story. At, at its roots, it is a it is a science fiction story. An alien from another planet lands on Earth, becomes, in some ways, a messianic uh, figure, and was also an attempt, I think, very literally, to create a an immigrant American Uberch, <laughs> <laughs> right in in very clear ways against what was happening in Germany at the, at the time in 1938, right. And starting to start to see some really terrible things happening. Right. So that I think was a very clear and yes, coded, but pretty explicit vision of an American immigrant who was in fact the salvific hero for American culture against this potential dark threat, European threat, right? Um, and 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 created by Jews, right? And and the and is still today the most one of the most beloved. I mean, look at the way people are going crazy about the comics. Just announcing that Superman's son. Um, John Kent Mazel is going know, to be by Mazel Mazel Tov to them. That's fantastic. Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. So, so you know, the fact that we, that the debates around that are people feeling like their childhood hero has been somehow tainted. But again, the fact that this childhood hero is at its roots a Jewish idea built on Jewish fears and Jewish hopes, I think really tells us a lot about the impact 
right um, that we had in in these in these areas. How this this Superman anthology from the 30s to the 80s that my uh, late uncle bought for me, and it is absolutely my favorite book. I've had it since I was young. It's been in my bookshelf forever. I've taken it to five different places where I've lived, and I love when it shows Superman just like taking a tank, a Nazi tank, and tossing it at those effers and watching it blow up. Like that is the ultimate. Jewish fantasy of being this absolute, you know, hero with unlimited power, just like, hey, <laughs> oppressor, take your own tank and blow up. Just loved it. Anyway. <laughs> right. You know, his real name is quite Jewish. Has that L, that God. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. absolutely. There's no doubt. Yes. Yep. Uh so you just mentioned the coded nature of many of the characters. Um that we kind of see in sci-fi. But I have noticed, especially with comics, comics being, as you said, such a very uh, Jewish in origin uh, medium, I've noticed that sometimes in adaptations from page to screen, we do lose the Jewish aspects or the things that we know are coded or explicit. So, I mean, for example, we have one, one end of that spectrum, which is Magneto. We all know he's Jewish because it's very clearly in the films, you know, as well, obviously, in the comics. Oh, I love that scene great. in the films with the Oh, date. yeah, and the first oh X-Men. Beautiful, and the scene. beautiful scene. If anyone hasn't I watched it, I can't imagine because anybody who has it. I, it's probably the best of yeah. the X-Men films. Still. Okay, yeah, I, I haven't seen you, you really oh, you're are, in for a treat, um, Ashley. The very first scene. Uh, is extremely Jewish, speaks to Magneto's specific Jewish experience of the Holocaust, and informs who he is. So I've never felt that he's the villain. You know what? I just don't. Um, but there are other characters who... Yeah. And he's not, not real. Really? I mean, he probably is the most complicated villain he's, in the Marvel series. Exactly. Sort of he's complex because of those past experiences. And now, I mean, it's obvious, and so many people have talked about, this is not a new idea that the X-Men are a metaphor for Jews. Yes. So it definitely started, Magneto's story is Jewish. And from there, yes, absolutely, there's been it's been a metaphor for more than that. But um, I also know that there's been the adaptations in the MCU particularly that have dropped um, a majority of the Jewish aspects of certain characters, like Wanda Maximoff from uh, WandaVision. I do believe originally a Jewish and Romani character, but um, she and Quicksilver are are Jews in part, right. uh, but not in the films or television shows. And if anyone watched, I don't know if anybody did, but Legion on FX, yes. um, in the original material, David Haller... Who's uh, in who Downton Abbey, Abbey comes, by the way? See, it all <laughs> comes together. It is a circle. It is, <laughs> I can't it is believe Dan it Stevens. Up. It is indeed. Um, it's actually a great, great, great mind-blowing show. It really it's is. over now, but it's truly... Um, for those who are listening, I just made an explosion face. For those who are watching, you've seen what it looks like. Okay, so so originally his parents met in Israel, but that's not part of the show, right? So you also the adaptations of Catwoman or you know Kitty Pride, Jewish characters. We don't really get that vibe from the adaptation. So I'm curious about what your perception is of this sort of change from page to screen where the Jewish elements or qualities or um, characteristics get get dropped. What do you think about that? Well, again, I think that what's important is let I mean, this goes back to the to the point, I guess. Yes, we want to have representation, mm -hmm. but you don't need Jewish characters to elicit Jewish concerns and themes. But I don't right. want to be robbed of my representation. <laughs> right. Yes, of course. But when we're talking about Jewish science fiction, remember what we're not we're not talking about whether or not the characters themselves are Jewish. Hmm. I, I think that that's going to lead us to only wanting to pinpoint those locations where we're looking for those explicit things. But we're not going to find them as much because – for Jewish science fiction writers and creators, it was not as important to populate the stories with Jews, but rather, again, to find ways to use science fiction as a genre to explore those things that are of most concern. So that's why Superman is an immigrant from another planet and not even raised by Jews. I don't think that in any way is going to limit 
what what we're looking for. Captain America was created by uh, Jewish creators, and he's also a science fiction character because his powers come from a super soldier serum, right? And he also does a very good job of punching Nazis and smashing tanks, right? We all know this is about trying to win the war. We can't do that without bullets and bandages, tanks and tents. Now that's where you come in. Every bond you buy will help protect someone you love. We we'll keep our boys armed and ready, and the Germans will think twice about trying to get the drop on us. Right. I am curious about what your um, take on a is about Isaac Asimov because Jewish writer did not write unless I'm and do correct me if I'm wrong. He did not write. Jewish stuff, quote unquote. And yet there's so many themes within his work that could be pulled out as rep- representing his experience or a Jewish way of thinking, but not explicitly. Do you No, I agree, but that? I also think that he represents something that's very important in also thinking about the Jewish, especially the Jewish American experience. Mm. Jewish Americans, I feel, especially in, in a certain period of time, you know, these sort of first generation immigrants wanted very much to be part of, adapt to, and transform the modern world using reason, science, rational. There's, there's, I think Judaism as a religion is one that upholds the notion of rational thought as a primary tool to its um to both its practice and its relationship to the world more so than you know not to say that other religions are rational i mean all religion i guess at its core is something that is irrational it's part of that part of our experience but Jews themselves have always embraced many, if you know, um, the sort of rational elements because Jews want to understand and use reason and use rational thought as a way of, of understanding and making sense of the world and their relationship to God. So a scientist like Asimov writing science fiction makes perfect sense Jewish as a Jewish writer, whether or not there's anything explicit in there. Because I think that's another thing that has attracted a lot of Jewish writers and creators to science fiction is because it's dealing with never minding Jewish things, but rational, modern, scientific things that have always inspired the Jewish experience. You know, that is I love that answer. the opposite of the perfect segue into my next question. Because our our <laughs> listeners have waited 32 minutes for us to mention the <laughs> S word, spaceballs. When naturally, when people like Miriam and me think of Jews in space and science fiction, our minds immediately go to spaceballs. And a huge shout out to Mel Brooks and Joan Rivers of Blessed Memory. That is an explicitly Jewish sci-fi parody. What is a classic non-parody sci-fi film or book or TV show that you think is just as deeply Jewish, maybe not Spaceballs level Jewish, in theme or content? Well, I'm going to go with novels. I'm going to go with Plot Against America Mm. by Philip Roth. Again, we're we're now playing into the alternate history as science fiction, but it it is a a legit... Mm -hmm. Subgenre, yeah. man in the high castle. Yeah. I was just gonna say, man in the high castle. Yeah, yep. Um, it's very interesting though that those things that seem to be explicitly Jewish in the realm of science fiction tend to be these alternative histories because that's the thing that we are just perpetually wrestling with, right? It's you know, imagining the future, <laughs> it's easy to imagine the future. That isn't necessarily Jewish at a macro level, but it's 
but there's no way to reimagine the past without having to try to rewrite that story or reimagine it in a, in a different way, even when the outcome is still going to be terrible. But I just want to go back to space real quick, because speaking of space, inquiring minds, namely me, want to know, are there aliens anywhere in the entire Jewish holy scriptures, the Tanakh, the Talmud, the Zohar, etc.? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, so, well, let's do it this way. There are those that believe <laughs> that what Ezekiel saw was a spaceship. It does. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and the whole ancient alien sort of world um, really hinges in many ways. Not only, we, we tend to think that it hinges sort of on the Aztec or the Incan you know, type. I, I, um, I was about to do so, the entire but, start of Battlestar Galactica. I'm, I'm right. I'm, um, yeah. But, but there was a fellow named uh, Eric Von Daniken and he thought that Ezekiel's Merkaba vision was actually seeing a UFO. And another fellow, um, Joseph Bloomrick, he was like, there's no way this is true. I'm going to disprove it, but ends up then thinking that actually, no, it's it's actually true, and he you can get his book that has drawings of what the craft looked like, and you know that this was definitely an encounter with, um, with aliens. So much more interesting than your basic flying saucer. Yeah. Oh, it's but do continue, great. yeah. But it 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 does serve to this notion that if we are to encounter something like that, it should blow our minds. Right. It should turn into a visionary experience rather than just, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So the fact that that's built into the vision, I think, does lend itself to a sort of more close encounters, you know, a psychic connected thing to this other world that will forever change humanity. I think is is really important. Now, another Jewish creator, Jack Kirby, who is a comic book artist and worked very closely, obviously, with Stan Lee, Stanley Lieber originally, and uh, he created a whole vision um, of alien as oh. mysticism. Even his his Thor comic books really reinvented the Norse mythology by turning them more into sort of like aliens who have access to technology than just simply sort of divine beings. One of his great um, inventions is this young man, Galactus, <laughs> the world eater, for those who are listening and not watching, Peter is holding up a figurine. <laughs> this is more than a figurine. Oh, I do apologize. <laughs> Just so you can see how big <laughs> this is. I got what? this for a dollar. It's like wood. two feet tall. Yeah. You know, uh, know. four-time podcast champions bring props. Yeah, they props bring props. And they thank bring you, props. Peter. Yes, you, they you do. Know, yep. You know this work. You know we're on so, video. So Gal <laughs> right, exactly. So Galactus is a world eater, and what Galactus does is he seems like he's an alien. There's a couple of wonderful things about Galactus that um, other creators have played with. One is that every alien race sees Galactus through the lens of their cultural interpretations, which I love, and, and does bespeak of a kind of... Um, ineffable thing that manifests emanates in the world right through these different qualities and aspects it's very sephirot it's very, very kabbalistic sephirot. the other thing that galactus does is that essentially what he does is he eats planets and eventually he'll eat the entire universe so that when there is the heat death of the universe galactus will implode a little tsim tsim there for everybody who might know what that means, explode and create a new universe. So he's actually an essential part of, of, of creation, of everything, even though we're always trying to stop him. Fantastic Four is always trying to stop him because he, he's trying to come and eat Earth, which eventually he's going to have to if he's to sort of fulfill his 
his destiny, as it were. I think the timing of that is really interesting. Tim Tsum, it's a Kabbalah uh, concept, and it's prevalent now in this month of Cheshvan, which we literally just entered. Ashley, I am, I am so proud right now. I am quelling. I am quelling. I am absolutely quelling. Um, Peter, I am kind of, I always think that we discuss this every uh, year you're on the pod, but the Nephilim, I also know, could be read as extraterrestrial, perhaps? Absolutely. The sons of God come down from heaven and um, take earthly wives. Um, I'm sure there are many a um, alien abductee survivor who would tell you that very thing right. has happened. Um, let's, while we're on the subject, let's do a quick round of pop culture things, sci-fi things that are, are very Jewish, that are just like on the tops of our heads. Um, obviously, we talked about Spock's Kohen Gadol Blessing, uh, which Leonard Nimoy took right from from Judaism. You know, you've got the the Jedi Maccabee parallels that we've talked in previous episodes. Also, there's the, the Dune movie coming out shortly, Frank Herbert's Dune. And there is so much messianic Jewish things in Dune, explicit Jewishness. In fact, that is a, a work in which you find in the series actual Jews in space, not just, you know, an allegory for Jews, but actual Jews practicing their religion in some form in space. And many ideas and terms carry over that, you know, there's that Benny Gesserit litany against fear. Fear is the mind killer. And then there's this other one by Rebbe Nachman, which goes, the whole world is a narrow bridge. The main thing is to not be afraid. Mm -hmm. So what are some just things that pop to mind for all of this? Let's go to Peter first. Just things that you're like, yeah, that is definitely, that is something in a sci-fi franchise or, or medium in some way. That's, that's Jewy. Well, I'm sorry to say that my examples air on the potentially anti-Semitic side. You know what? Go for it, because I think yeah. Dan had some thoughts <laughs> yeah, in that I same think way. It, there's there's oh, some uh, critique that the Ferengi <laughs> in Star Trek oh, I uh, that might be a Wait, little hold bit on, we hold on, hold on. What are you doing? We can't trust a Ferengi. What? He's not a Ferengi. Yes, he is. Oh, I think he's a Bolian. Oh, my God. He cannot be more Ferengi. The big ears, the beady eyes, the greedy thing they do with their hands. Human. Yeah. There's a little bit of a, of a Yiddishkeit in the uh, character of that of the slave traders and the I had that menace. too, Watto. The, <laughs> the kind of Eastern European, kind of Sicilian, kind of Israeli. Yeah. Terrible, yes. terrible creature. Both, both. Yes, with the big and, nose. And a he freaking hat. I mean, like, they really yeah, leaned yeah, into it's it. Not, it's not good. I need parts for a J-Type 327 Nubian. Ah, yes, Nubian. We have lots of that. Pinake, uh, Cabriaco. My droid has a readout of what I need. It's very Kipa esque. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. It's not good. All right, the yeah. only one I had that you didn't have, Peter, wow. and, and, you know, I, I, of course, go to worst case scenarios as well. Um, was Jeff Goldblum in Independence Day, who, while he was kind of nebbishy and a little whatever, he ends up being the hero. Um, so he was bold, he was adventurous, and, you know, in the end, he went, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Independence Day, uh, they went out, um, and, uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah of, course, of course. The Judd Hirsch is even worse, though, his dad. Oh, yes, God, that so was painful, fairly painful, painful, painful. Yeah. And even more so, how did a, how did a, um, Earth created USB stick fit in he the He brought alien. a lot of adapters so with him. You didn't see that, but he had a whole bag. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, I get it. You should see my drawers at home filled with a adapters. It's a really a universal <laughs> USB in a very literal sense. We were wondering to ourselves what kind of specifically Jewish problems Jewish characters could encounter in space. Uh, is Star Trek replicator food kosher? Well, I don't know. Based on the OU's ruling about fake meat, I'm not so sure. Um, how does one fully immerse in a mikvah in zero G where there's no gravity? Uh, how do you face Jerusalem to Davin during a flip and burn? Can an android be Jewish? What other questions do you guys wonder about Jewish life in space in the future out there 
in the stars. But back up, what did they say about fake meat? They said, okay, so the OU this week or last week, I forget what, said no, because I believe fake it was pork. It was a fake, fake pork, pork product. I want to be specifically. Impossible. Because it contained the word pork. Just change what it's called, people. Um, but it was more, th- so there's this idea in Judaism, you put a fence around the Torah, y- you do extra, extra, extra beyond your actual prohibition so that nobody thinks you've accidentally gone and eaten something on kosher. So in this case, they're like, no, people might actually think you're eating pork. So that's a no. So you wouldn't have cheese on an impossible burger. So that's a really interesting question. I- and I could spend an hour talking about this. I believe you can, <laughs> as long as you have something near the impossible burger that says very clearly, this is a veggie burger. A sign. Yeah, with an arrow. And this I is... can't do that with the pork. This so is well, that's here's the thing. too I wanna... close to trying to get around a prohibition. But what about bacon bits? Those are kosher. Here's what I'm going to say. I don't, the I don't OU like it. is just <laughs> one organization. And just because the OU is not going to put their heck sure, their, uh, their literal sign that they um, certify the cash route, doesn't mean that other groups would also take the same stance. I think we still have to see clearly if bacon bits or fake bacon bits are kosher. Somebody else has said, okay, we'll put a hexer on it. So just because the OU did it doesn't mean that it'll be not kosher forever. Large salt cubes. That's just their stance. Yeah. But then I think to answer your question, though, I think then there is also that if I my understanding, and this goes to sort of if we visit an alien planet, if I am a guest in someone's home, am I allowed to eat what they serve? Well, no that's a great question. Like, is it an animal that has fins? In- okay, okay. Like, if they go to an alien planet and there's an analog for a cow, right? It's got hooves. It chews its cud. And you hexure it. You kill it as- uh, appropriately. Could you? <laughs> but what if it's a normal zingle zoggle? Well, I don't think it has, if it doesn't have fins and scales, and if it doesn't have, I think you have to base it on on what's in the Torah, or else we're getting, they'll be like, nah, because I don't know what a blurble okay, blurble looks like. What if I'm starving? Ah, Save a life. Story. Okay, if it's so an if issue, I'm stranded a life. on an a alien life planet. Or death scenario, you can right. eat the bizarre bizarre. I, okay. I have a, a an issue about passage of time in space because um, so much of Jewish holidays are time based. So how do you know sunrise, sunset, uh, beginning, end of? You know, it's if you're if you're seeing how I think many you sunsets. Have to take it with you. I think it's ported th- on the ship you're on. And if you're in a constant that's orbit, that's self contained. You're seeing a constant sunrise, right. sunset, right? Well. Amazingly enough, we, we do, do have a bit of an answer to this one. It is part of our end, though, to this episode. So before we answer this question, is there anything further, Peter, that you want to add about Jewish sci-fi? Opportunity or not missed, but I would urge listeners to actually go seek out Jewish writers. Um, you know, there's a lot of great... Um, People sort of working uh, and currently working in industry. There's if it, there's actually some really great lists right now online of uh, looking if you want to find uh, Jewish writers. There's collections of science fiction that do have explicit Jewish themes in them. So I urge people to 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 really look for contemporary uh, authors right now. They're they're doing this work. We will include a list at your recommendation, Peter, in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to know who Peter is talking about and some writers, uh, authors to check out, check the show notes for this episode. So before we wrap, we wanted to take our science fiction to science fact. As we prepared for this episode, we started talking about what we just said, the practicality of Jews and being Jewish in space. And we were reminded of an incredible Israeli, Elan Ramon. He was the first Israeli astronaut, the first person to request kosher space food, which NASA accommodated, and the first person to bring a Torah and mezuzah to space. Although not especially religious, Elan's commitment to Judaism and the Jewish people was so important 
that he actually sought rabbinic counsel for some of the questions we asked ourselves. Like, how do you observe Shabbat when each day in space is 90 minutes and Shabbat is every 10 and a half hours? And I think Rosh Hashanah is like every 24 days. A group of rabbis did come to a consensus that the timing of Shabbat is based on the 24-hour rotation of the earth, so Ilan could observe Shabbat every seven Earth days based on when Shabbat began in Cape Canaveral, the launch site, or as one rabbi ruled, uh, in Israel, because that's where he was from. Ilan, however, said he would probably do it on Houston time since that's the time zone the astronauts would follow in space. The son of a Holocaust survivor, Ilan, also carried with him a copy of a drawing done by Peter Gintz, a 16-year-old who was killed in Auschwitz. It was a picture of the Earth the way he imagined it looked from the moon. Ilan was tragically killed in the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, and we would like to dedicate this episode to him. May your memory be for a blessing and inspire the next generation of Jews with dreams of the stars. So thank you to Peter, Dan, and Ashley for joining me on this episode today to talk about Jewish sci-fi. It's great to be here again. Great to have you back, Peter. Happy Halloween. You're always a pleasure. Happy Halloween. <laughs> and thank you to our audience out there for listening. If you liked what you heard, be sure to rate and review the vibe of the tribe wherever you listen to pods and follow at Jewish Boston on social media. Take care, everybody, and live long and prosper.